Welcome to Gold Derby. I'm Denton Davidson here with PGA Awards nominee Adela Romanski, executive producer of the Underground Railroad. And Adela, when I watched this film or limited series, I'm sorry, I went in completely blind because I'm just I'm someone who doesn't like trailers. I didn't want to know anything about it. So I was kind of and I wasn't familiar with the book. So I was shocked to see that it was sort of this interweaving of fantasy um, and uh, the shocking reality of American history. And I'm curious when when you were getting it off the ground and creating it, were you concerned about how audiences might react to this story um, on screen? Um, and the fact that it's not like a historical fact-based series yeah. we might expect. First of all, I love that you called it a film because I think <laughs> I feel like it's incredibly cinematic. And if you wanted to throw it up in a theater and watch it as a 10 hour film, you could. So I, I, I appreciate the faux pas. Um, yeah, as far as like, how is the audience going to receive this? I mean, we did a lot of um, uh, like, like we had early conversations with focus groups about the novel, um, mm -hmm. in a few different American cities and specifically focusing the conversation around uh, black television audiences and, and also white television audiences too, but like starting a dialogue early in terms of what, what people felt was sacred to the text and needed to be respected in the translation. And also perhaps where some of the imagery could be considered too sensational. Um, and so I think that was a balance that, that we were always having to kind of find um, through the journey of the, of the show. And it's interesting too that you that you kind of like reference the maybe less factual basis for it, and I and I assume that comes from the idea that like the the way that Colton approached the material in the novel, it's there's this other fantastical you know sort of the fact that there's like an actual train. It. Yeah, there's a train underground with right. like a steam train underground, which never has ever existed in any part of our, of our history and, and making the metaphor literal in that way. But I think, you know, Colson at some point said he, in writing the novel, wouldn't necessarily stick to the facts, but he would stick to the truth. Mm. And I think that's something that Barry preserved in his adaptation and how he approached the material. And, and we too honored that in our approach to it. And I think, I think it's all true, even if at times it's not all factual. I guess is what I would say about that. That's a great way of putting it. Um, the feelings are true and speak through. Um, and it's, you know, what is a limited series availability done for you? Because you come from film, you've, you've yeah. worked a lot in film and you have this, I mean, now you've got something that you want to show over 10 hours and a limited series really allows you to do that and dig into the characters and show their feelings and their truth. Mm -hmm. um, so what for you is, um, has, have you enjoyed about creating a limited series in this way? I mean, I think you just nailed it in your question. You know, it's an opportunity to go deeper into character, go, go into a longer story that maybe like there, I'm sure could have been a version, not by us, but, but by somebody else that was the two hour version of this book we weren't interested in that. And, and we had to lose a lot even to get it to the 10 hours that it ultimately ran at. Um, but just thinking about how much richer the lives of the characters were and the ability to, to go and spend time with, you know, not even the, um, like the, the, the day player characters as, as we call them, but, but even like the background, like there are background characters in, in our show that were given like full complete lives and dimensionality. And I think, um, I mean, also, honestly, like there, there's resources there for us, you know, to tell, to tell stories in television that are, that are starting to feel like they're shrinking a little bit in the, in the feature side and the sort of prestige feature business. I think Mark kind of touched on that too, when in your conversation, just the opportunity, um, to tell a certain kind of story at a certain scale that you know, feels a bit threatened as of late in the, in the feature space. And you've worked with Barry Jenkins often. Um, he's a frequent collaborator of yours. You direct, uh, he directed this as well as Moonlight, which you won best picture for. That's 
an Oscar night we'll never forget. Um, I'm sure that's seared into your mind as well. Um, but my mind and yet I also cannot remember it, but go on. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, how did that relationship with Barry form in the first place? And, you know, what do you like most about collaborating with him? Um, so Barry and I have known each other since college, which is now, you know, 20 years past. That's the beginning of the relationship. Uh, we made student films together. We went off our separate ways and, and started our careers um, and then eventually came back together to make Moonlight. And now we have this company together and it's myself, Barry and Mark Sariak, who's another EP on the show and also our partner at the company and also an, a, a college classmate of ours. So um, it's a long history. Um, I think that's one of the things I'm most grateful for is the it the, the family aspect, I suppose, of, of how we work together and knowing that you sometimes struggle with family, but also ultimately you are family and you can never change that. And um, there's a really true love that exists. And, um, and then there's all the stuff about being chosen family, right? Like the respect and the admiration uh, for that person's work and their craft and, and how they think, you know, um, and I, so I think it's that very like sort of perfect blend of, of chosen family is how I would, yeah. And what for you was the biggest challenge of, of you know, getting this limited series off the ground? Because it, I mean, it, it does cover uh, not so much time, but the location, um, it's beautiful outdoor landscapes. I'm curious, you know, how long, it, how long the filming process took and, and where you filmed? We uh, filmed basically in a span of an entire year. So it was a 116 day shoot, which across prep and across hiatus, we ended up being a year. We were sandwiched. Uh, we evacuated twice on the front end for a hurricane and on the back end for a pandemic. Um, and all in the state of Georgia, which the, the long duration of filming across that year actually ended up really proving advantageous in terms of maximizing across seasons. Because I think the thing about the show that, you know, I don't, I don't know that it was very difficult. And sometimes you forget, like when you get excited about such an incredible piece of material, like the novel, um, you, you have this Pulitzer Prize winning novel. It's an incredible piece of writing. Everybody is jazzed to go out and make it. And you kind of forget like, oh, it's this wildly ambitious road movie right that, that travels like how many different states and each episode is its own for, for the most part its own set of characters like we have Tuso sorry we have um Cora the main the main protagonist and Ridgeway and Homer across the whole the whole 10 episodes well more or less but um everybody else is a revolving cast of characters every episode is a new set it's a new location there's no like amortization, as we say in TV across the show. So it was huge. And so I guess the, the greatest challenge was that meeting point of ambition and reality and trying to figure out how to rein it in to meet the budget and meet the schedule. Um, I think I stopped answering your question. What was the rest of the, what did I forget to answer that you just asked? No, that was, that was great. <laughs> um, my, I also was, I, so blown away by the cast um, yeah. you know i'm curious how that process was to find a two so Nido is a cora aaron pierre as caesar um one of my favorites chase dylan as homer it's just you know finding this cast who aren't a-listers but i mean they might be shortly uh, they're well on their way so what was that process like um i personally love the casting process i know barry does as well it's so so rewarding to three-dimensionalize, you know, what was previously just, you know, words on a page. And we never know who they're gonna be. I don't, I don't think there's ever, I certainly don't read it with, with cast in mind. And um, we worked with uh, casting genius, Francine Maisler, who, um, who also uh, casts Succession and uh, works with McKay and works with uh, um, Wang Jun-ho and is just incredible. And, um, she was a real partner across that with us and like truly searched the globe. You know, Tuso, Tuso is from South Africa. So it was sort of far and wide. Um, and I think Barry, to, to his credit, was, was 
of a mind that this role, this role is anyone's. Um, really, truly, I'm, I'm not, I'm not limiting it to locale or to experience um, or to recognition, name recognition, like come in and show me your Quora and your Quora. And that's what Tiso did. Well, it's a, a beautiful limited series. Um, Adela, congratulations on the PGA Awards nomination for the Underground Railroad. And thank you so much for speaking with us today. Thank you very much. Pleasure.